Today on Blue 58, the Packers have an epic rematch in the works for this weekend. A chance to play in the Super Bowl hangs in the balance. All they have to do is beat Tom Brady and the Buccaneers and avenge their worst loss of 2020. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of ThePowerSweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. We've got a lot to get to in this episode, so let's start getting right to it. First, with some news out of Tampa Bay. It looks like big defensive tackle Vita Vea may be on his way back to the football field. He has been activated from injured reserve and may be ready to play this weekend. If you will remember, he was injured way back in week five, just before the Packers and Buccaneers played. He fractured his ankle late in the Buccaneers' win over the Chicago Bears and has been on injured reserve since then. I am skeptical as to whether or not he's going to be able to play. I don't think this is necessarily gamesmanship from the Buccaneers. I don't think they're trying to confuse the Packers or try to get the Packers to game plan for Vita Vea on Sunday. I think that for a couple reasons. First, he's a big dude who plays no tackle. I mean, there's not a lot of game planning that you're going to have to do to figure out what impact he's going to have on the lineup. You know where he's going to be and what he's going to be doing when he's there. Secondly, if he's just coming off of injured reserve, chances are he's not going to be in, in game shape anyway. So it's we're probably talking about like Snacks Harrison numbers here. 10 to 15 snaps on the high end. Uh, maybe he's a force when he's in there, maybe not. Uh, but I think the Packers are still going to probably have an advantage here. Bucks seem like they're probably preparing for the Super Bowl at this point, which is fair. The Packers are making moves and maneuvering to be in the best position they can be for two weeks from this weekend as well. And that's what you should be doing. You should be preparing for the future. And that's what the Buccaneers seem to be trying to do right now. Nevertheless, if Mr. Vea was able to play this weekend, it would be a significant change from the last time the Buccaneers and the Packers played, all the way back in week six. So I wanted to take a second, a few seconds, and talk about what is different since the last time the Buccaneers and Packers played. It's a little bit, though not incredibly unusual, to play a team outside of your division a second time in the playoffs. It's happened fairly frequently for the Packers. We've seen it with the Seahawks a couple times over the years. We've seen it uh, with the Arizona Cardinals in the playoffs, we've seen it with the the 49ers, so a lot of NFC West teams, I guess. But the stakes in this one are a little bit different. Obviously, a trip to the Super Bowl, and the Packers did not play all that well in their first go-round with the Bucks. So the narrative engines are running hot already. So let's take a second, slow down the conversations, and talk about just what's different especially for the Packers, since the last time these two played. First and foremost, David Bakhtiari is gone. He left midway through the Packers game against the Buccaneers in Week 6 with a chest injury, was out for three weeks after that, returned, and then was lost for the season with a torn ACL. It still seems like a bit of a bad dream, finding out about Bakhtiari being lost for the year. This is a weird one in that it works a little bit in the, not the Packers' favor, but it's not as bad as it could have been. Given that Bakhtiari was injured already once this year, the Packers have had a plan in place for when he went down again, and they are working that plan again, and it's working well. Billy Turner is playing pretty well at left tackle, did a good job against the Rams' defensive line uh, last weekend, and now gets a chance to do it again against another good defensive front. So not necessarily the biggest change, but also a pretty big change for the Packers. Another big change is who isn't playing. Josh Jackson and Oren Burks basically aren't playing at all anymore, and both played pretty significant snaps the last time around. Josh Jackson played every single snap, 64 of them, the last time the Packers played the Buccaneers, and boy, it did not go well. He gave up at least one touchdown. Uh, was responsible for a 40-yard defensive pass interference call and generally proved why he hasn't been in the lineup more. Oren Burks, meanwhile, played 14 snaps and gave up a big completion to Rob Gronkowski while he is out there. Since then, he has played single digits in every single game at most, other than the, the 49ers game. Burks played 34 snaps in that game. But other than that, he's played 26 total snaps 
the rest of the way. Single digits in every single game. He is not a factor at linebacker at all. And that is probably for the better for the Packers, because unsettled though their inside linebacker position may be, it is still better off probably without Oren Burks in the lineup with any kind of regularity. More to the point, the Packers did not have the services there of fellow inside linebackers Christian Kirksey and Kamal Martin. And you can say what you will about those two. They certainly have their faults, but they are probably better. Not probably, they are better as a duo than Oren Burks and Ty Summers. Those guys didn't play at all. And Josh Jackson and Oren Burks, at least for them, played an awful lot. Now neither of those guys are playing, and Martin and Kirksey are regular contributors in the lineup. Also on defense... Rashawn Gary barely played against the Buccaneers. He was hurt the previous week against the Saints and was still hobbled against the Buccaneers dealing with an ankle injury. He played 17 snaps and was not super effective in those snaps. One of the things he contributed to that game was a face mask penalty that gave the Buccaneers 15 yards on top of a third down conversion. Now, though, Rashawn Gary is playing some of the best football of his career. According to Pro Football Focus, he is one of, if not the highest graded edge rusher in the NFL over the past month of games or so. And he's generally proving the Packers right in taking him 12th overall, having a very, very strong finish to his rookie season. Going along with that, Preston Smith is playing less but playing much better. We've talked consistently over the year about how his pressure numbers have increased basically week over week. We don't have to go through those numbers point by point, but they've generally been pointing up. But related to that, he's playing significantly less. In the four games prior to the Packers' loss in Tampa, Preston Smith played 90% or more of the defensive snaps in three games and 85% in the other. Since Tampa, he has never played more than 90% of the snaps in a game and has played more than 80% just three times. Rashawn Gary is playing a bigger and bigger role and playing well. And Preston Smith is being asked to do well and his performance is improving as a result as well. The Buccaneers put up 38 points, yes, but there are some significant caveats, and one of the biggest ones is that they basically didn't play against the best version of the Packers' defense. They barely played against any of the Packers' defense. On offense, there are a couple significant changes as well. Back when the Packers first played the Buccaneers, Aaron Rodgers was carrying the offense a lot more. Every game leading up to the Buccaneers game, and including their trip to Tampa Bay, but that's mitigated some by the fact that they were trailing for most of the game, Rodgers had thrown 30-plus passes in every single game. Thanks to big contributions on the ground and just otherworldly efficiency on top of that, Aaron Rodgers has now thrown fewer passes in four of the Packers' last six games. He's being wildly efficient. And a lot more people are helping him on offense, too. He's also getting some help just by having more people to throw the ball to. Alan Lazard is back in the lineup. He was out the first time. This was the first game he was out with his core muscle injury that he had sustained against the Saints. He had just had that monster game in New Orleans. Six catches, 146 yards. He's just now rounding back into form. So things are going to look pretty different for the Packers' passing attack. Prior to the Rams game, Lazard had had 197 catches or 197 yards, 197 catches would have been something. No, 197 yards over seven games. But in the Rams game alone, he had 96 catches, 96 yards on four catches. He is getting back to where he was at the very best time. So things are looking better for the Packers. Things are also looking better for the Buccaneers. As the season has gone on, Tom Brady has gotten more and more efficient on offense. His EPA per play has gone up week over week over week. The numbers are out there. 
I won't uh, cite the super granular stuff there, but it has continued to go up as the season has gone on. But the Packers' defense has improved as well, as we've laid it out. So which side's improvement matters more? To give you some numbers on how the two sides have improved, through five weeks, Tampa Bay had put up the 10th best offense in the NFL by DVOA. The Packers, meanwhile, had not played particularly well on defense. They were the 29th best defense in football by DVOA at that same point. Now, though, the Buccaneers are rolling out the league's third best offense by DVOA. They've jumped from 10th to 3rd, but the Packers have improved as well. They've gone from the league's 17th best or 29th best defense to the league's 17th best defense. A big jump, to be sure. And I think the improvement here that matters most is the Packers' defense. Not so much necessarily for how they're playing, but as we've laid out previously, for who is playing. The Packers are pretty close, if not exactly on, where they would like to be in terms of personnel availability. I think they have all 11 of their Week 1 starters out there. If not, it's darn close. And they basically can pick and choose from their lineup whoever they want to throw in there. They want a little bit heavier defensive front, they go with Damon Harrison. Want to go a little bit lighter, rotate Dean Lowry in there a little bit more. Or Tyler Lancaster. They didn't rotate Harrison in all that much last week, we should add. Uh, That's a little bit of a mystery to me. I'm not entirely sure why that was but I I am hopeful that he will still be an active participant going forward. But the Packers have basically the group that they've been hoping for all season. They are able to put out there their preferred 11, 12, 13, if they go further down the list in their sub packages, to counter the offense. The Buccaneers have been playing better But I think the Packers have improved to the level where they're not just going to lose it for you outright. If they don't play well, if the game plan is not not up to snuff, and that's a real concern that we're going to talk about in in the preview coming up on Friday, they can still fall on their face. But I think the defensive improvement is the real story to watch here, especially with what we saw from Tom Brady against the Saints defense last week. And this is something that I want to lead to into to kind of close down the podcast. Brady's stats were pedestrian at best. And the real story coming out of that game is that Drew Brees threw three interceptions or had four turnovers or whatever it was. He started to lose track after a while. He turned it over a bunch. If the Packers can make Brady be pedestrian, I think there's a real chance the Packers not only win, but win big again. Because with their full complement of offensive players playing well, I think the Packers actually match up pretty well against the Buccaneers' defense. They've got the people out there to beat man-to-man. They've got the scheme out there to beat man-to-man. They've got playmakers in the backfield, at tight end, on the outside. Not always consistent playmakers, but they are there. And in the right circumstances, they can make big plays. That improvement by the Packers' defense is huge. And I want to conclude by talking not just about the Packers' defense, but about basically the ideas going into this game. The narratives. Narratives are a big deal in sports. Can't ignore them. That's part of what makes sports good, storylines, how teams come together, how they develop, blah, blah, blah. But narratives can mislead you. They can blind you, sometimes on purpose. And I don't think there's a player in modern NFL history that has benefited more from narrative myth-making than Tom Brady. I don't want to diminish his accomplishments. They are many. They are impressive. But this game is already being set up as... Well, a couple things. First, another chapter in the legend of Tom Brady. 
And it's true, he has had a long and storied career. But as last week shows, it's not always about the quarterback. In fact, it's very rarely entirely about the quarterback. But to look back at Tom Brady's career, you would get the impression that it is almost entirely about his great success and the waters of the NFL just parting before him as his unparalleled magnificence just shines down upon us all. Really hasn't been the case all the time. Look back at some of the early numbers in his time with the New England Patriots. It was Bill Belichick, defensive genius, finding a quarterback who could just not screw it up for him that got them their first two or three Super Bowls. That should not be a controversial statement. But in some parts of the country, if you said that out loud, you might not leave those parts of the country. This game is being set up as Tom Brady, the NFL Messiah in some ways, versus Aaron Rodgers, spun by some as the great never was. It's a good thing he got that first Super Bowl because otherwise, who who knows? He might have retired already or something. But that's silly. We know that things outside the quarterback's control can affect how a game goes. We also know that games are not about one quarterback against another one. All right? This is getting set up as Tom Brady versus Aaron Rodgers. I'm sorry, when is Aaron Rodgers ever going to be responsible for what Tom Brady does on the football field? Brady might have to respond to Rodgers, sure, but it's not like what one person does has any real effect on the other. It's just lazy, and it's uninteresting. How can Tom Brady pick apart a Packers defense that has at times played really well? That's an interesting story. Can Aaron Rodgers overcome a defense that sent him to his worst performance of what is probably going to end up being an MVP year? That, too, is an interesting story. Tom Brady versus Aaron Rodgers is the story we're going to get. And that's not particularly interesting at all. So part, I think, of being smarter football fans heading into this weekend is just divorcing ourselves from those narratives. We're not even going to take them up. We're not going to talk about Aaron Rodgers versus Tom Brady or how Aaron Rodgers' performance against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers positions himself relative to the success of Tom Brady, such as it is, or how Tom Brady, in some kind of performance, compares to Aaron Rodgers playing against an entirely different team. I've often heard it said that one of the greatest weaknesses in Aaron Rodgers' statistical resume historically is he never gets to play against the Packers' defense. And boy, if that isn't true. He doesn't get to play against the Packers' defense. But he's also not going to play against Tom Brady at all. So let's let that narrative go. And let's do our part as football fans to continue to bury things like that. So I've got for you in this episode. Do appreciate you tuning in. Uh, I hope you are having a great week fending off those nerves as we prepare to watch this NFC Championship game on Sunday. I know I'm looking forward to it quite a lot. If you found this show useful and you think somebody else in your circle may find it useful as well, I'd appreciate it if you'd go ahead and send it along to them because that's going to help us continue to grow this conversation we're having around the Packers and ultimately help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.